So thanks everybody for being here. I appreciate that. And especially Dave and Kevin, since you guys are our guest experts here today. Uh, so, experts, a strong word. Yes. Well, we'll go with it. So Kevin Hill and Dave Stanley are friends and train crew members also who actually work or have worked uh, for railroads. And the idea here for this hangout was to have them join us so that anybody who has questions about prototype railroading could ask them. And it could be in the context of, you know, I want to try to duplicate what's done in real life cl more closely on my model or could just be general curiosity. So with that, we'll pass this off. Which one of you guys wants to go first? Go ahead, uh, Kevin. Age before beauty, so we'll let uh, Dave go here. Uh, okay, well, I'm Dave Stanley, been retired from uh, railroading since 2015, and I worked uh, 41 years, four months, five days. I'm not sure how many minutes and seconds, but it was quite a bit. And uh, with all the mergers and whatnot, I actually worked on seven different railroads. I calculated that out this morning. Uh, started with Central California Traction, uh, got furloughed there in 1977, worked for two months on the Oregon, California, and Eastern up in Klamath Falls, which was Weyerhaeuser's uh, logging and lumber railroad. Came back to the Central Cal Traction. In 1978, they furloughed me again. I went to the Western Pacific where I worked for three months, got furloughed there, came back to Central Cal Traction, and then eventually went back to WP. And then of course in 1982, Union, Union Pacific took over the WP, and uh, that's who I remained with until my retirement. But during that interim, I worked, of course, Tidewater Southern trains, Sacramento Northern trains, and after 1996, I worked mostly Southern Pacific. So I covered uh, a lot of railroad from uh, Dunsmuir to the north and uh, actually just south of Bakersfield, Sand Cut. I, uh, that's as close as I got to Tehachapi Loop. I think Jack, Jack Burgess has me aced on that. He got it right over to Tehachapi. And uh, I've worked the coast down to Watsonville. I've worked all the branch lines in the Central Valley, worked Donner. Feather River Canyon, and of course, like I said, Dunsmuir. So that that's kind of my scope of railroading. I was an engineer for the last 27 years, uh, yard master for five years prior to that, and a trainman, brakeman, conductor, switchman, uh, prior all well, between 1974 and 1988. So there you go. There's my life history in a nutshell. <laughs> Well, my name's Kevin Hill. I've uh, I started my railroad career in 2010, and uh, I worked for Genesee in Wyoming. I started out with Genesee in Wyoming uh, in Lathrop, California, and uh, that was a very interesting location for us because if you were standing trackside, you would have thought that it was a UP train or a UP crew or anything like that because we worked out of the intermodal terminal there. And uh, we used UP power. We ran on the UP main line. We dealt with the UP dispatchers, and uh, and we didn't know each other yet. But Dave probably handed off power to me on many occasions. And uh, so yeah, I was there until 2017. And at that point, I was starting to um, miss the Central Coast. I grew up on the Central Coast here, and. Uh, I asked a friend of mine who was acquaintances with the general manager of the short line out here if if they were looking for anybody. And as it turns out, they were. And long story short, I ended up on the Santa Cruz and Monterey Bay Railway out here, which, of course, is the former uh, Southern Pacific Santa Cruz branch. And Iowa Pacific ran that branch up until 2018. And then... Uh, they they don't even exist anymore, of course, but now Progressive Rail runs the branch line. It's 100 times better, and uh, we're growing our business. We've 
we're a five day a week short line now. So it's uh, nice out here. That's my story. So I had a question. We kind of talked about this beforehand and I just wondered, and I guess since you're still active on the screen here, Kevin, you can take the question first. Uh, what do you think? I'm going to ask a modeling question because I'm interested in applying prototype practices to operations. What do you think are the key things to include for modeling the kind of jobs that you do? So, and maybe explain that. So mostly what you're doing now is switching and running short, short runs of cars to, to various locations there in Watsonville. Maybe, could you maybe comment on that? And then Dave, if you wouldn't mind taking that question after it, I appreciate that. Well, something that might be interesting. I mean, if, if you're, modeling a short line or something like that it's, a, it's an entirely different world than a class one if you've got a class one that's working in local you know and they're switching industries that industry gets one switch and then they're done but for us um a lot of times we have one customer that only has two spots and they can get very busy at times so sometimes we'll come in in the morning give them a switch go to interchange and then when you come back maybe you switch them again so multiple switches for the same customer in the same shift might be something that you would incorporate if you're if you're working a short line. Yeah, and you can do that pretty much on on any layout. Uh, WP was always pretty good about taking care of the customer, and if they needed a multiple switch, we would do the same with them. Uh, Tidewater Southern, we used to get carloads of melons out of the Turlock area, <clears throat> and uh, I know there were times when uh, they would keep an extra job on duty just to pull and spot the sheds. In fact, CCT did that in Lodi with the grapes during grape season. So um, yeah, on, on a model railroad, I mean, on my layout, I have a fairly big uh, uh, produce district uh, called a Campo, a Campo, Campo. And uh, uh, I have the option, I haven't done it yet, but I have the option of assigning a locomotive up there that basically would be pulling and spotting the industries that the sheds as uh, mainline trains come through and set out cars for them. Uh, the way I run my layout now, I have several locals that go to a compo and they actually do the work. And a lot of times it's uh, not the same railroad going in there. So they have to, uh, they have to be able to pull the car that may have been previously spotted if if it's not blue flagged or red flagged by the customer, if they're not in there loading or unloading the car. I mean, it, you you can expand on this uh, in a lot of different fashion, but uh, anyway, that's that's my thought regarding uh, multiple switches and, and uh, whatnot. I guess I'll ask another question. By the way, if anybody wants to, there's also a text screen it's on the uh, computer screen. It's a chat icon down toward the bottom of the right screen. You can also type a question in there if you want to, and I'll try to monitor that. So the question that I have is kind of similar to the one that we already talked about, <clears throat> which is what, which jobs would you consider or most likely want to uh, compress, compress out of your operations? if you're doing model railroading, like for example, and I, I wish I could remember who it was. Uh, I think it was Seth Newman on the model railroading 101 <laughs> video about operations where he said that a lot of jobs get compressed out of your model railroading as well, like clerks and, you know, office pe pencil pushers, you know, paper pushers, basically. Surely there must've been paperwork or that kind of things that you would just as soon not include because they don't add anything to the enjoyment like of an operating session we'll comment on that a little bit well you know model railroads especially mine have tied aisle spaces and on the real railroad your locals at least when i was working you had two brakemen and a conductor along with the engineer so you had a four-man crew and trying to run that on a model railroad isn't going to cut it unless you have a <laughs> very big aisle ways and people that can get along real well and don't argue about switch moves. Um, so on, on my layout, I've compressed basically everybody but one guy. So you, if, if you get one of my locals, you are the engineer and the conductor and the brakeman. Uh, once in a while, I'll 
pair a couple people up, depending on how many people show up for the off session. So that would be, to me, in my mind, right at the moment, that's one of the major things I would, or, you know, would compress out during a, uh, a model ra railroad off session. I don't know. Arguing about switch moves might uh, add to the realism. <laughs> <laughs> it does. <laughs> As I mentioned uh, before we officially started the call, I on my layouts, I'm I'm a loop runner because uh, for me, I, I switch cars when I'm at work, so I don't want to do it when I'm at home. So I just want to sit back with a cocktail and watch the train go around and appreciate the models for what they are. And, you know, so I don't have a whole lot to add as far as that goes, but, you know, that's that's just me. It sounds like what you're saying is you compress the whole job out <laughs> for what you do. Yeah. And we allow drinking on the job. Well, we do that as well. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I won't say that that never happened in the real world because <laughs> it did. I, I know hey. I've talked to, to, sorry, Kevin, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I've talked to people who worked for, it was especially with SP, who worked for SP, and they said that if you didn't drink on the job, you probably didn't work there. <laughs> well, one of the uh, the UP managers that I used to work with, that uh, Dave, you know this guy. We talked about him in the past. I won't mention names, but uh, he he had told a story one time that when he first started with the SP, his job when they would come to a town was to run to the nearest store and stock the caboose with beer. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the situations like that. Yeah. Uh, on the uh, on the Tidewater Southern, and I won't mention any names, obviously, but we had a 5 p.m. job that went to work in Modesto, and our work took us from Modesto up to Manteca and then back down to Modesto. So we'd work Franzia Winery. We still switched a few sheds. We had, uh, oh, I don't know, five or six different customers out there, and as soon as we got off of 9th Street in Modesto, and we were usually caboose hop, <laughs> we'd stop, and the rear brakeman, which was not me, I didn't have enough seniority back then, but the rear brakeman would get off and head to the liquor store and pick up a six-pack <laughs> and uh, throw it in the ice, and then we would go about our business. And then when we got up there between uh, North Modesto and, and, and uh, Escalon, we'd get out in the orchards out there and stop the train, and kill all the lights on the caboose and on the engine and just go back to the caboose and hang out for about 40 minutes. <laughs> so, yeah, that stuff went on. It did. No denying it. Everybody knows it. So. <laughs> See, well, now, but you can admit that now, though, Dave, because you're Heck retired. Yeah. And they can't fire you for that. <laughs> <laughs> they might try. <laughs> and all, all, all the guilty parties are all retired, too. That or passed on. So. <laughs> So yeah. there's a question in our text chat window, and someone is asking, I think it's Bill. Yeah, Bill's asking, do you use actual paperwork for switch lists, or are they on the laptop? So, oh, someone else commented, sounds like precision socializing, I guess, <laughs> about the beer. <laughs> yeah, precision socializing. Uh, I use... Uh... A, a paper switch list that come off the laptop. I mean, I, I when I'm done, when I'm done uh, with a job or one of the guys is done with a job, I go back to the laptop and I move the program on so all the cars get uh, sorted out to where they're supposed to be going. So yeah, it's a combination of using the laptop out that I keep out in the train room and then the the paperwork that that I can generate off of it. But they're not the same type of list I would get at work. Uh, these the, the JMRI lists, and there's probably a way to get around this. I haven't, I'm not smart enough to figure it out yet, but their lists are a little bit redundant in times and you have to kind of go through it and figure out what you're, what you're looking for and what you don't need to look at. But that's what I use anyway on my layout. I have a question for people who do operations here. I don't know if it's done, in an operating session or not, but I know fast clock is a thing. You run the the uh, clock to scale with the uh, the modeling. Does anybody model hours of service? Like you could say, oh, this crew's coming up on 12 hours. We got to do a crew change here. Is that done? 
Not on my railroad. <laughs> yeah, I, I actually there are people on the the chat here that probably do that that are probably actually very qualified to answer that question of how they run their operations. So Dave or Jack, I know for sure you guys are aware of how long your your operators are are operating on the fast clock. You want to comment about that? Sure. Um, I run a eight to one fast clock and sessions are typically all oh, two to three hours and no one no one has to stop because they've exceeded their hours. I'm not sure that, well, in 1939, the hours were longer than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I usually, well, I shouldn't say usually. I have at times uh, recorded stuff and say, okay, he, this is the last engineer in and he just did a 16 hour day, um, which the, the YV was, the passenger trains would start at in the summer, start at 5.30. So these guys went on board probably about five in order to pick up Pullman's at 5.30. They would get to El Portel, the other end of the line at nine. They would lay over till seven at night, get back uh, by the time they put everything away at about 11.30. So they were sleeping in a box car up at El Portel all day long. And um, Still, still stayed married, I guess. <laughs> cool. This is Dave Adams, and uh, we've had the same experience. We were, we went on fast clock. Uh, right now, we've moved from three to one to four to one on that. But yeah, I do keep uh, on the dispatcher's train sheet. I keep track of hours of service. You know, when somebody, when we when we call them, and then when they finally tie up, that's all entered in there. Uh, as a general rule, uh, folks don't, do not break the hours of service law. The exception to that is, is when I'm hosting for invitationals and things of this sort. And uh, in some cases there, we've had some uh, prototype railroaders that uh, did everything by the book, including the required lunch breaks and things of this sort. In that case is, yeah, they died on the law. They, they you know, <laughs> terminated, tied up at 16 hours out on the road. And uh, that... Uh, that resulted in the session the next day picking up exactly where these guys left off. Turns out by the clock, we the guy crew got exactly eight hours rest. The operator at that particular station had gone back on duty. So we got orders fixed up and got him out of the way before he tied up the rest of the rest of the session. But that was fun. So but I do keep track of the hours of service, but people die on the laws in general rule. They don't. <laughs> You do a good job, Dave. I, I really enjoyed running your layout the one time I was there, and, and you you do it by the book, and I, I think that's pretty cool. Oh, thanks, Dave. So according to the text chat window, Bill was actually wondering about what you guys were using on the real job as far as paperwork and switch lists and that kind of thing when he asked whether it was on the laptop or not. Well, if you go back to the 70s uh, on the traction company, we had typewritten lists uh, that we picked up right there at the at the Stockton shops before we left with our train. And uh, that had all of our work uh, basically typed up on a switch list. And then, uh, gosh, on the WP, I'm trying to think what they, everything was pretty well machine printed out. Uh, when UP came along, they started messing with work orders and really relying on the computer. And we were getting work orders with a lot of phantom moves on there, moves that we would not normally make. Moving a maintenance away car that's sitting off in a weed-grown spur with a red flag hanging on it. And on our work order, it says, go move it. Well, you can't. You know, there's all these safeguards uh, or sometimes the switch would be spiked you couldn't even get in there so you know over over the years things changed uh, when i was the yard master uh, i was able to put out switch lists uh, you know via the computer and the, and the printer down in the switch shanty and uh, i could go in the computer program and override where cars were to go what you know change track designations that sort of thing but uh, back on the CCT, it was all type, typed and uh, sometimes handwritten as well. And uh, that's what we had to work with. 
for us on our short line right now, um, every morning at 5.30 in the morning, we get a report from UP with whatever cars they've brought for us on our interchange track. And I'd say for the most part, um, probably 98% it's accurate. Sometimes it shows cars that didn't actually show up, but that's that's a whole other story. On that list, it's a really simple list. It shows the car number and what industry it's for. So from there, it's up to our conductor. He knows what order all the cars have to be in uh, for the order when we're going back where they need to be dropped off and spotted. So it's for us, it's really simple. And you're not dealing with a whole lot of cars every day. So so th those decisions are basically made by jo John's the conductor. Those are yeah. made by the conductor then? Every yeah. Time? So and he knows what order that he needs to put his cars in. And sometimes I fight with him. But for the most part, I mean, the most cars that we usually handle on a day would be something like 10 cars. So we're not dealing with a whole lot of cars. Right. So but you're finding that you're having to switch your work for the day right there in the yard then, huh? Yeah. And now we can actually do that. Um, thanks to PSR, because in the old days, the Monterey job would be going on duty right as we'd be getting into the yard. So we'd have to kind of switch things out as we got back on our own side. But now we'll usually build our train right in the yard. So that brings up kind of an interesting point. And I'm not trying to hog the conversation here, guys. If anybody has a question, let us know and you can certainly ask it. But I'm kind of curious about so sort of the the logistics of it. So a local comes down from wherever. It used to be the Salinas Holler. It might still be. And mm -hmm. brings stuff to the Watsonville Yard for you. And they what do they have it on a specific track where they set it out and it's always on that track. It's for you guys. And you're allowed to use like a specific set of tracks for your switch moves. How does that work? Okay. So I'll give you the pre-PSR and the current. Here's what's happening version of that because there's two versions we had an interchange track in the yard and up until last week they would put our cars any cars they had for us in that track okay and then we'd come in and we'd know that's where our cars are going to be and we'd pick them up and then we'd switch them into the order that we needed them to be in in well now with uh, psr as i told you john and they've eliminated the daily Monterey local, which was the day job that worked in the morning. Now, traditionally, that job would come on duty first thing in the morning and switch out the consist from the Salinas hauler that would come in overnight, and they would put our cars in the interchange track. Well, now, without that job in the morning, the Salinas hauler comes back, dumps their cars in the yard all in one cut, cuts the power off, and goes and ties up. So we have to switch out the whole Salinas hauler every morning to get our cars out. Oh, so they've actually added a bunch of work to your daily job then, haven't they? Yep. How many cars are you normally switching off of that big cut? I mean, like how how big is the main cut of cars that you have to take your cars out of? And well, are they all jumbled up in there? Like you're having to... Yeah, they're all up. Bunch of... And oh. usually... And the hauler is an interesting train. It can be anywhere from 10 cars long to 40 cars long, depending on what they brought back that day. So there's nothing in the agreement between UP and your railroad about having your cut off on that track? They just do what they want? Kind they just of? do what they want. They just, well, a lot of times, too, they're short on time when they're coming back because they got a lot of extra work to do now, too. So right. if they can get back to the yard, they're happy, and they just cut their power off and go home. Right. How was that different from when you were doing stuff, Dave? Because you said you were a yard master before. Did you have to deal with that kind of that kind of situation too, where arriving trains well, had to have stuff cut off into interchange tracks or that kind of thing? The the way it used to work, uh, uh, like working when I was working for CCT, is and and even with the WP, you had you had the dedicated interchange track, like Kevin's talking about. But if you went into that track and there were your cars plus somebody else's cars that didn't belong to you, you had to switch them out. That was always a penalty claim. You got a day's pay for doing that. Oh. 
as far as trains coming in and going dead on the law, yeah, that that happens a lot. And I can see now on the UP the way they've tried to eliminate jobs and then double the work up on everybody else that's still got a job. Uh, I can see where that Salinas job is probably coming in there, just screeching in below the hours of service. And then Kevin, yeah, you guys are what? You're non-union, I'm assuming. So there's no time slip involved. And, and the UP crew knows that. And unfortunately for you, you have to go out and dig your cars out of their cut. Yep. So that's, yeah, it wasn't always that way. There used to be a lot of attention paid to where the cars were left so that they were on the right designated track. Um, one of the interchange moves a lot of guys don't realize, uh, and I do this on my layout, uh, if you're a, a UP or WP engine and you've got cars for the, the BNSF or the Santa Fe there in Stockton, you would run, a lot of times you would take a transfer cut from the UP yard over to the Mormon yard, BNSF yard. And even if they had cars for you to bring back, you didn't bring them back. You came back light engine. They would have to deliver their cars to the UP yard, and then they would go back light engine. That's just the way the interchange agreements were written. So on my layout, I have a place called Junction City, which is kind of an interchange yard. And then I have Marotta Yard, which is the main yard. And Junction City will haul the Marotta Yard cars over to Marotta Yard, cut them off, leave them there, come back light engine. Marotta Yard later on in the shift would bring cars over to Junction City. Same thing. He would leave those cars and then he would go back light. So that's something that I've carried over into my operating scheme on my layout. I find that kind of interesting because as someone just operating a model railroad, it makes sense sort of, uh, what's the word for it, efficiency-wise to just take the cars while you're there. You know, with mm -hmm. whatever with whatever power you have. So that's interesting. It's interesting to me that you did not compress that particular move out or the rule, I guess. Well, I did originally, and then I started thinking, you know, I can have a little more fun with this. So yeah. we'll, uh, we'll we'll do it kind of like the prototype. <clears throat> yeah, that's really cool. Alvin's asking if it gets stressful switching cars around, and I'm sure he's talking about prototype. Does that is that something that can get stress stressing you out? Especially probably you, Kevin, because <laughs> you're having to deal with something that just get just got left there. Yeah, and before I touch on that, I will say uh, to Dave, uh, we actually have uh, we have smart on this railroad. So does it cover anything like that on interchange? No, your, your don't have any it? interchange stuff. Well, maybe yeah. maybe explain what that is because I, I it used to be known as UTU the the united transportation union now it's smart what is it it's a union sheet metal oh. and okay and so transportation union i yeah. think is what it stands for isn't it yeah oh sheet metal and rail transportation or something like that mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> so you're so kevin you're saying that the uh spp is yeah. is on that oh okay i didn't know that yeah you, right but now but UP is under a different union, though, aren't they? Yeah, I think they're, I believe they're BLE, aren't they? That would be my guess. Well, the engineers are. The trainmen have a choice of being BLE or they can be in SMART as well. So. But to, I, uh, to I Alvin's was UTU question. and then BLE. Yeah. To Alvin's question, I mean, not really on our railroad. I mean, we're not going to be, no matter what, we're not going to switch for 12 hours. Eventually, we're going to you know get our train together and go but when i was in lathrop sometimes you know switching out the intermodal stuff they would do pure what they used to call pure spine repos and the whole repo train had to be ttx spine so you'd have to go through pull a whole track out and switch out individual spines and you know dave you probably ran some of those yeah i did and, yeah that, that's that what we would the take them from Lathrop over to Mariposa quite often. Yeah. Over on the BNSF, which was way beyond our limits as a UP crew. We weren't supposed to go beyond Mormon Yard, but we'd go, what is it, an extra four or five miles down to Mariposa. Yeah. And what was the purpose behind that movement? 
wh- why were they having to switch out the TTX? Was that just to get the cars back to who owns them or what? I would assume so. Um, oh, I, I, oh, they didn't tell you? They were just like, here, do this. Yeah, they just said, here, pure TTX is go. <laughs> well, I would think BNSF probably had a need for them, whereas UP may not have had a need for them that particular day. So I don't know how their agreement works with trailer train, but yeah, but uh, I would assume it's kind of like car box. You know, if, if they're needed, they, they'll move them, you know, from carrier to carrier without any type of... Uh, uh, conflict <clears throat> yeah well here's a question coming in on on the uh, chat window uh, chris wants to know and I, I don't i don't even know if you'll be able to answer this because it may have not happened yet but it says what is your <laughs> actually i have a, i have a couple of guesses too what is your initial reaction when you're switching and a car happens to derail and let's try not to cuss here let's just <laughs> <laughs> oh bleep <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> has that happened i mean how, how many times did you have problems with that dave you you were around a long time did did you get a lot of derailments on your job quite a few and i i have one incident i will tell you about because it happened twice at the exact same spot and both times i was on a high handbrake and it was on the cct we were spotting guild winery up in lodi and I was the head brakeman, so my job was to put the handbrakes on the on the cars while the rear brakeman spotted the cars at the industry door. So we were shoving in the Guild Winery. I was on this UP. It was a UP box car, high handbrake. Most of them were low brakes by then, but this one was still up on top. So I'm up on top, and the car I'm riding on decides to pick the switch point. Next thing I know, we're bouncing. And I don't remember climbing down that ladder, but I must have come down real fast because I didn't know what was going to happen with that car. It never came uncoupled, but I didn't know if it was going to roll over or what. About two weeks later, same scenario. I'm up on a high handbrake. I think it was a UP car again. Same switch. And it happened to me a second time. And I thought, that's it. I, this, there's, there's something going on here. So... Uh, that one always stands out, but yeah, there were there were other incidences where a wheel would come off or somebody would shove through a switch and then pull the wrong way. And then you had a That's car fun. going caddy wampus. So. Yeah, yeah, we had a beautiful one in Lathrop. I I don't know if Dave was ever around to see this, but uh, the engineer that was working that uh, that day ran through the switch there on. Uh, Dave, if you remember, 702 and 703 were on the far side of the yard. Mm-hmm. Ran ran through that switch coming out of 703. Didn't notice it. I was on the rear of the train. And uh, then, of course, he starts to shove. And the whole train jackknifed off that switch. And there, was, there must have been probably 10 cars all screwed up there. And he kept shoving. Because miraculously, the air didn't bust until these 10 cars all jackknifed right there. And the thing goes in emergency, and I and I can't see it because, you know, those cuts were long. So I was way down in the track, and the thing goes in emergency, and I said, what happened? And there was silence. And I was like, <laughs> um, okay. And in that yard, a lot of times the conductor would use a truck to get around, and so I jumped in the truck and went up to the head end, and I started seeing cars in going in all different directions. Said, oh, this ain't good. So, yeah, that was fun. We we had a one other big one that comes to mind in Oakland Yard on the, the WP Yard back when it still existed, and we were on the uh, OANP, which is the Oakland North Platte. It left in the morning out of Oakland, going back to Stockton, and uh, the the uh, midnight yard master had set the train with his switch crew and at the rear of the train were uh, a bunch of empty well cars container cars uh, without the containers just the wells and when he he was down there taking the shove for the switch crew the yard master was and he neglected to see one switch was lying wrong and he shoved through it and shoved about 20 cars through it well they were still on the track and of course nobody knew that the, the switch had been run through. We get on the engines, put our engines on the train, do the air test. 
and we get a high ball from the car department and I start pulling 10 mile an hour, trying to pull 10 mile an hour and the engine's really working hard. And there's a carman that's up by the yard office and he's going to roll us by as we leave to make sure everything's, uh, you know, on the up and up. And I told him, I said, this thing's pulling like it's got some handbrakes in it. He says, all right, I'll keep an eye on them. Well, I kept pulling. I got down to the first crossing. So probably, I don't know, maybe an eighth of a mile. And the yard master comes on the radio. He says, stop your train, stop your train, OANP, stop your train. We got something bad back there. <laughs> and, <laughs> and all those well cars that went through that switch, the trucks were gone. The well cars were literally belly flopping on the rail and the air never broke. We never went into emergency. And of course, five minutes after that, when the car department drove down there, you should have heard everything on the radio. So we never did get to see it. We heard about it and they, they made a cut. We pulled ahead a little bit. They moved Fred up from the rear up to the, our rear car and told us take off for Stockton. And we never heard a thing about it. I mean, it wasn't our fault, but it's amazing. <laughs> now, nowadays, the way the UP would work is even if you were remotely in the area once something happened, they'd have you in peeing and doing everything else. So, yeah, you're going to go take a pee test after that. Oh, gosh. Even yeah, then they're in the office. <laughs> yeah, then they'll tell you you're up for investigation just for being in the vicinity. Yeah. So, crazy. There's one fella's railroad I operate on, and he goes in his orientation, he goes through all the sound buttons and all that sort of thing. And then he goes, there's one sound I don't want to hear. And that's, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Alvin has a question. He wants to know, and I think you kind of answered this in a way here, Dave, at least for that one big problem in Oakland. But Alvin wants to know, how do you fix a derailed car? How do you, how do you deal with that? How do we deal with it? Right. Well, in the case of yeah, in the case of the story you just told, someone else ended up dealing with it for you. But how, what do you guys do when something goes on the ground? What's the process to get it back to get it right? Well, in, in the old days, back in the '70s, that you had a derail on your switch engine or on your locomotive, and you'd go back there with this derail and and try to find some uh, uh, hard yeah. hardwood, maybe off of a, a flat car or something, and you try to pull the car back up on your own. You didn't try. For very long if it wasn't going to come you left it alone and had somebody come out that knew what they were doing <laughs> but, but that's how we used to do it but by the 1980s if you had anything derailed you just got on the horn and called somebody and and you know they'd get maintenance way out there to and the car department out there to get get the car back on the track car department maintenance way if the track was damaged but Quick question, usually on, it wasn't too bad Right. So quick question. Would, would that, so you, you would just have to call them and then you'd have to wait or could you cut off and go on to your destination with the, the rest of the train or did it matter of what the priority was or anything like that? Well, it was a manager's call. And if you had cars derailed that had, that may have the possibility of rolling over once you uncoupled from them, you obviously wouldn't uncouple. So you, you basically let the managers make the call on something like that. That's that was not our position to uh, make a call like that. So at the time when they were still using cabooses, would you have to? And if the manager said, you know, go ahead and take the rest of this train to where it needs to go, how did you go about retrieving the caboose, or did you just go without a caboose and have everybody up in the cab? How did that work? Well, I'm sure it all depends on the situation. Uh, uh, if your caboose is stranded back there and you can't get it up to the rear of your train, yeah, you'd have to get everybody up on the engine and go. <clears throat> I don't ever recall being in that position myself because most of the time if we had a derailment, it was, in fact, for me, it was always on a yard engine or maybe a local. It was I never had a mainline derailment my entire career, so I, I was one of the lucky ones. So, Alvin's worried that if he left the caboose behind, you would leave the beer there too. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Somebody better go throw it in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what about you, Kevin? Have you had to deal with derailments on the smaller uh, railroad? And how do you go about putting them back on if you do? Well, 
Lots of blocks. So you're just using wood, huh? Yep. Blocks, and then uh, just kind of walk them back up. I mean, it only happened once while I was here. Then it was due to a uh, track failure in an industry track. But, uh, yeah, you just walk them back up. And it's I was amazed how well that worked. I'd, you know, I'd never done anything like that before, being – it coming from where I came from, so. <laughs> now, Kevin, when you guys have a derailment like that, it, that's kind of a, your baby to do what you can do with it before you call somebody else in, right? Yeah, because you call Holcher or somebody that costs a fortune, so they don't want to do. They don't want to do that. <laughs> okay. So, is that some kind of a contractor? Yeah, that's that's the contractor we used to use. Like whenever, Jim Dovis. Whenever anybody'd screw up. Mike's ha Mike has a question about the power that the Tidewater, Tidewater Southern was running when you were working for them, Dave. He's curious whether they were using RS1s or something. <laughs> I would imagine it was something newer than that, but why don't you? Yeah, I, by the time I got there, which was 1978, the, uh, the RS1s that were on the Tidewater, the 746, was over at CCT. So I got to work on that RS1. That was the old... Uh, Tidewater engine. The 747 was already out of service and scrapped. So on the Tidewater itself, when I got there, we were using GP9s, GP7s, and GP20s. And then when I became an engineer in the UP era, uh, we had, of course, anything from uh, uh, GP35 and 40 all the way up to the big six axle power, depending on if we were on a grain train or if we were on one of the locals. The grain train's got the big power. So there's another question in the comments here, which is from Chris. He wants to know how you feel when you get to work on a new locomotive for the first time. Is there kind of a new car feeling to that, or what's it like? <laughs> it depends well, what kind of engine it is. Maybe it's a piece of junk. <laughs> <laughs> a new piece of junk. Yeah. <laughs> I remember being in Portola and... And the first desktop, for me anyway, engine showed up on my westbound train to bring me back to Stockton. And I got up there and I looked at this thing. I thought, okay, let's see, where's the reverser go? Once you get that, that's half the battle. <laughs> and uh, uh, and it, it was it was weird. It was really weird. But once once we got moving, it it kind of all, you know, it all clicked. I I never liked the desktop controls. You just don't have you know it's too easy to go too far on a notch as far as throttling especially as far as throttling uh but uh but we got through with it you know we got by it now they've gone back to the, the standard control stand in in the newer in you know, newer you know comfort cab type locomotives yeah i don't i don't think i've ever talked to anybody that's like the desktops um for me i'm a shorter guy but I've got long legs and a short torso. So in the position that I had to have the seat in to reach the controls, I had to hunch like this and your back starts to hurt after a while. So oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, I didn't like them either. We called them motorboat controls. But, uh, anyway. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It, of course, everything UP said was oh, they were designed ergonomically by another engineer. And I thought, who is this guy? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. This is probably more for you, Dave, as someone who was a yard master, because I'm assuming that the yard master is responsible for what I'm going to ask you. And that mm -hmm. is, you know, we go out rail fanning, foaming, whatever you want to call it. And you see a train go by and you're like, wow, that one had eight locomotives on it. Or maybe, maybe four up front and two DPUs or whatever. How do they figure out one which locomotives to use and how many, and two, if it's going to have a DPU, how do they figure out the, the placement of the DPU or DPUs as they were? You're asking the wrong guy. <laughs> That's a power desk question. Yeah, uh, Omaha power desk. Uh, Paul DeLuca, if you're on here, Paul's a model railroader. He's retired from the Omaha uh, oh, locomotive so, desk. So that's not done by Yardmasters then? 
No, okay. no. Our our See? job was to basically build the train, get the blocks correct, and and keep keep all your engines busy. Basically, keep them productive. Um, the, so, so the roundhouse would basically the roundhouse foreman would call Omaha and say, "I've got this train. Uh, the computer says it's going to be so many tons." And uh, and then Omaha says, "Okay, we're going to do. We'll run it two by two or three or four on the head end." That sort of thing. When the DPs came into play, I was no longer a yard master. So that was all stuff that happened while I was in en engine service. But as an engineer, you just take what they give you. You don't, you don't, you know, you have no say in the matter. Uh, you might have to isolate some of your power if you have too much. Uh, uh, somebody's put a question on my phone. No, I haven't run on Paul DeLuca's layout. <laughs> uh, Anyway, as an engineer, you have to know the, the, uh, your uh, tons per operative brake. You've got to know the horsepower per ton. You take all your engines and you start doing the math and decide if you can you know, leave all of them online or if you have to isolate a couple. And then I always hated doing that because then they turn into very heavy boxcars. Yeah. So you just put more strain on your working locomotives. But... Uh, yeah, that that was not a yard master's position to figure out the placement of the locomotive. So, what about as an engineer operating the train? How do you interact, or how 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 is it working with DPUs? Like, how do you know what they're doing and know that they're doing what they're supposed to be doing? And I think probably both of you guys can talk about this because I'm pretty sure, Kevin, that you probably yeah. worked with trains in Lathrop that had DPUs, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can definitely feel them back there, but on your display you'll have a screen, depending on what kind of unit it is. It's either right in front of you or it's over to the side here, and it'll tell you here's your A unit, that's your leader, and then you'll have a B, C, and so on for your your DPUs, and it'll show you what that engine's doing, and then you can actually go on there and isolate it, isolate the dupe if you want to, and all this stuff. So you can actually control all that stuff from the engine, from the leader. Um, so can, you can, can, you can, can you put the fence, what we call the fence up, and yep. you can actually have your dupes do something differently than your head end. Mm -hmm. And where that really came into play for me was on the Dunsmuir run. As, as you get north of Red Bluff and you run through Blue Tent and Hooker Hill, you're on a roller coaster. I mean, it looks like the Big Dipper at Santa Cruz. <laughs> and you might have dupes back there and especially coming south with the lumber loads. Uh, you're, you might have your engines on the head end in dynamic as you're starting down a hill, but you still got your dupes powered and shoving to keep your train bunched up so you don't get a knuckle. And then you've got to hit your counter so that you know when your dupes get to the top of the hill so you can slip in them in the dynamic and... Uh, you know, and, and do it at the right time. Otherwise, you're going to come screaming down into Red Bluff doing about 70 miles an hour <laughs> on 45 mile an hour track. So it can keep you busy. Uh, if you're out in the flats running from Roseville to Fresno or Bakersfield, you don't need the fence. You can uh, just leave them. Uh, I forget what the term was, but they would whatever you do on the lead engine, the Dukes would do as well. And uh, if you're starting a train from a dead stop and you've got dupes on the back, you can get up to speed pretty quick, a lot more than if all your power is on the head end. So du dupes were good. I never had a problem with them. Uh, some people didn't like running them, but it didn't bother me. I, sometimes I thought they were they were beneficial to have. As long as the dupe's set up to run in the right direction. <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> no more stories about that person. Yeah. <laughs> well, you you see these trains, for example, you know, over to Hatchapi or whatever, and they use DPUs all over the place there. They have to. And you see them string line. And sometimes I wonder, you know, was that caused by someone that wasn't running the train properly? Do you know what I mean? Like, because if you if you slow down your DPUs, uh, they could they, that could cause a string line if you're on a big curve or on a bunch of curves or something, right? Yeah, you've got to be careful. Usually, though, John, I don't think it's so much the operator as it is the, the train makeup. You know, if they get too many light cars on the head end, especially up there, 
it wouldn't take much to pull them off the rail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. I mean, that just, could happen even without dupes. You know? Just like on, on model railroading, I know that a lot of people will put light stuff, flat cars or whatever, toward the back of the train just so that you don't streamline it. Yeah. So there, that, that plays in on the real things too then, huh? That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. the loads, loads you always want to have up towards the power, and then as you go back, you'll have your empties there. Yeah, when we used make... to build the uh, the Burlington Northern trains out of stock and yard, as, as a yard master, I always had to have, I think it was five loads on the head end, five or seven, I forget what it was now, but we always had to make sure we had loads on those BN trains that were going north out of stock and going up, that were heading up to Klamath Falls. Basically because of Wolf Creek, up right up there at Tunnel 6, uh, not too far out of Greenville, you had a real, real tight curve there. Uh, series of curves actually and they they had string lining problems in the past so they decided that that they had to really pay attention to how they built those trains on the the dupes too as far as modeling a lot of people maybe don't know if you have a dpu consist only one of the engines in that dpu consist has to be dupe capable and then that'll act as the leader for the consist and then all the other engines and that dupe consist will do what the leader tells them to do. So like a lot of times when we were building trains out of Lathrop, you'd have, you know, like a, a Jeevo would be the, the dupe leader and then you'd have an SD70M behind it. And the SD70Ms of course aren't DPU capable, but it'll do what its mother tells it to do. Because they're MU to the Jeevo? Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Oh, interesting. So, okay. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, you could MUF sevens up to it if you can find some. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a couple sitting in Stockton right now. Yeah, I'll go over there and fire them up after I get yeah. off the phone call. <laughs> <laughs> there's another question in the chat here, and this is for Kevin. Uh, Paul's interested to know if you've seen a reduction in car loads due to the virus. I know the answer, but I think he'll be surprised by what you tell him. Actually, the opposite. Our business has grown because uh, one of our biggest customers is a beer distributor. And here in the Bay Area and on the Central Coast, beer consumption has gone up 52% since the start of all this stuff. So we're seeing a bunch of beer car loads coming in. <laughs> Same here, yeah, Murata. Beer yeah. consumption's gone up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Ever since you ever since you retired, the 805 stock has gone up, right? That's right. <laughs> Firestone Walker, buy stock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so is anybody else uh, watching that hasn't asked a question, uh, of wanting to ask a, a question? And we have another question coming in on the edit, on the uh, chat here. But I just want to give a chance for anybody who's who's on viewing, who's not typing in the, the chat window. I, I'm really curious. Joey's here. Joey uh, Butzik has had this idea to even do this as a topic. So I was hoping you'd have a question, Joey. Do you have anything for us? Uh, all my questions were related to interchange. And you guys already talked about it. So I was like, hey, cool. I'll have to do a show up and listen. I kind of lucked out. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but it was your idea. Thanks for this idea. I think it's a cool conversation. Yeah, I, I figured it'd be fun for everyone. Thank you. So somebody... John, somebody asked if we'd ever gotten a knuckle. Uh, Kevin, I'm, I, I'll throw that one out to you first. I haven't. Okay. I, I got one, and it's sitting right here in my backyard now, just as a reminder. Uh, <laughs> auto rack trains, downtown Sacramento on the old WP. Luckily, it was 8 o'clock at night on a Sunday. We were headed west, and I had 7,000-foot train, all auto racks, loads, and uh, pulled up to a red signal at South Sacramento Yard, and all of a sudden it went green. So I kicked the air off, and I didn't wait long enough. I got in a hurry, so I started notching them out, and the front end of the train started moving, and we probably moved about 15 feet, and then the air went pow. I thought, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the conductor, Tony Nelson, says, oh, we didn't get a knuckle. I said, we got a knuckle. I know it. Uh, we didn't get a knuckle. I said, the air's not coming up, Tony. He had to walk all the way back. I think it was 10 cars from the rear <laughs> down by where the spaghetti factory restaurant is now, for those of you that have been there at the old WP station. 
So I, he told me where he stashed the knuckle, and I went through there a few weeks later on a light engine, and I, I knew where the knuckle was, so I stopped my engine that day and threw, threw it on with me and brought it home, and it's sitting out here by my wigwag now. <laughs> Little reminder. <laughs> so Al Alvin has a question, and I think I know the answer to this, but let's let's throw this to you guys. Alvin wants to know if real locomotives need to be speed matched like models do. No. <laughs> right? Uh, they don't need to be speed matched, Alvin. <laughs> Sometimes they don't, they don't, well, the older ones, like when you had WP or when you had Jeep 9s and, and uh, some of the newer Jeeps MU, you'd, you'd feel them making transition at different times, so they'd kick you a little bit, but Nothing more than that. So I'm kind of curious about that whole knuckle story. Is that something that's really looked down at? If you break a knuckle, you really don't know what you're doing. Like what? What's? It sounded like there was an air of of embarrassment to the to the prospect of having broken a knuckle. What what what's up with that? Well, not, normally if you break a knuckle, it means that you got in a big hurry. You know, which I did. I got in a hurry, and that was the extent of it. Now, I had a drawbar fall out in Wheatland on the uh, SP line, the East Valley line, and we're just putzing along at 25 through there on flat, fairly flat track, and all of a sudden the train went into emergency and the whole drawbar came out of a car, and it was basically just a bad, uh, either a weld or whatever gave out. Uh, it had nothing to do with, uh, with what I was doing as an engineer. But, but normally a broken knuckle, it's uh, something, something you probably did something you shouldn't have. Either had too much throttle, too much horsepower going at slow speed, or in my case, I didn't wait for the brakes to release on the whole train before I started pulling on it. So, so quick question here. Now we're we're getting up to. We've been going for about an hour, which is all I asked you guys to do. And if we don't have a lot more questions from the people who are involved on the call, we'll go for an hour and we'll cut it there. Oh, well, we're I'm making kinda, over time, right? Yeah, yeah. You're going to get paid twice as much as you get paid for the first hour. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. That's fair, right? So the question is, I wonder if you could recount for the people on the call a, a close call or, you know, something something that you experienced that you won't forget. <laughs> I mean, nothing that if it's, you know, too traumatic or anything like that, but just, you know, maybe there was some idiot stopped on a grade crossing or something like that. Yeah, I've had a few of those. Uh, rather than going into grade crossing stories, I, I had one issue on the Santa Fe that, honestly, if, if the conditions were just slightly different, I wouldn't be here now. Um, we had the old Sacramento Northern Steel Train, uh, the old SN Detour. This is UP now. This was probably a 1990, oh, I don't know, 1994 maybe. And... Uh, we would run from Stockton out to uh, Pittsburgh and get off the uh, Santa Fe. We used Santa Fe track from Stockton to Pittsburgh. Then we'd get back on the Sacramento Northern line. And it was all train order, not train order, track warrant territory from Stockton West at that time. It's CTC now. And uh, we uh, had a, a track warrant to go to uh, Orwood, if anybody knows that piece of track out there and uh, clear out at Orwood. So we cleared out at Orwood, and the dispatcher calls and gives us a new track warrant from Orwood to Pittsburgh. Now that second track warrant gets us as far as we need to go. And it was not going to be into effect until after the arrival of Amtrak, whatever it was, 710 East at Orwood. So we got this track warrant to leave Orwood once Amtrak goes by us. So while we're sitting there waiting on Amtrak, this Santa Fe auto train also going west, which is the way we were going. They go run, roaring by us at Orwood. So I'm thinking, okay, they're going to probably clear out at Knightson, which is the next siding up, which they did. They pulled into Knightson. We didn't know that, but I assume they did. And then here comes Amtrak after another 20 minutes or so, and he goes by. So off we go. We got a track warrant now to go. So we're running on green signals. 
and we go around the curve at Bixler, and we're looking at Knightson, looking at the east signal, at, right at the east switch at Knightson, and it's green. Well, I see all these auto racks in the siding at Knightson, and it didn't dawn on me that that was the guy that had just gone around us. And just before I go by my green signal, it goes red. And I look up, and this guy is pulling out onto the main line ahead of us, about two miles ahead of us. And it's like, holy bleep. So I got the train slowed down and pulled up and stopped. And we sat there and watched this guy peeling out of nights in the 30 miles an hour right ahead of us. And like I told my conductor, if we'd gone by that signal before it went from green to red, and if we'd been in the fog, that would have been it. We would have probably both perished in that. So I I asked a friend of mine that worked for the Santa Fe how that could happen. He says, at that end of Knightson, there's a signal protecting the main line, of course, and then there's one on the siding. And he said, that guy's siding signal should have been red. And being red, he should have gone to the switch, lined the switch, and waited five minutes before he even started to move his train, just in case there was something coming, which was us and uh, they disregarded that that rule that five minute wait rule and just pulled out right in front of us <clears throat> so that was my my uh, never forget story believe me what about you kevin you had any close calls or not, not nearly as spectacular as that but uh i have two one both happened on this short line right here the first one was in the Iowa Pacific days when we were storing tank cars on the railroad and we were shoving a cut of tank cars up to where we were storing them and I was riding the shove and we we're coming to a crossing. The crossing's clear and then I see this truck pulling up to the crossing, a semi truck, and he stops. And then at the last minute, as we're getting ready to go through this crossing, shoving at about 10 miles an hour, the truck decides to go for it. Oh boy. And he goes and I'm not kidding you. We missed that trailer probably by a foot or less uh, when we went through there. And it was on my side, so I would have got nailed oh. if we'd have hit him. And so that was, I'll never forget that. And my oh. other one was coming into the UP yard around, um, we have a curve as we're coming into the UP yard on our railroad and as I and it's a uh, left hand curve and coming into the left hand curve we're coming out of right hand curve so it's kind of an S there and as we're coming out of this right hand curve I notice that there's a guy asleep on the side of the tracks and he's using the rail as a pillow so he's got his head on the rail so I threw the train in emergency and we missed squashing his head by a grape like a grape by about uh probably 10 feet and that that wasn't good and he didn't even wake up we stopped there and my conductor and i had to uh physically remove him from the rail i think he was drunk or something but yeah you don't forget those yeah i, I had two suicides in in my whole career I, and I, as far as i know they were the only fatalities i had i had hit quite a few vehicles but i don't think any of the others were Fatal. So I, I consider myself lucky on that. Yeah. Does knowing that they were suicides change the way you think about that kind of an incident? Yeah, I guess. I, I mean, it's a sad deal. It's a sad story. There's, you know, one was a man, one was a woman, and uh, both of them 2 a.m. suicides. They've probably been out drinking and and uh, whatnot, but. Uh, yeah, I, it, I I guess as an engineer or a trainman, your your greatest fear is, is kids, kids in an automobile, you know, especially young kids that aren't even doing the driving. And I had a friend that worked uh, on the on the UPWP uh, engineer, and he in his career he had enough fatalities. He had 11 kids killed in crossing accidents, and uh, I don't know how he ever kept it together. So. Well, now there's something you can compress and not do on your model railroad is have, uh, have yeah. people sleeping with their heads on the rails. 
Mm. Yeah. Well, on a model railroad, it might actually be kind of funny. But in the real thing, it's a different story. Uh, I want to ask you guys one last question, then we'll call this. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to make sure whether anybody else watching has any more questions for these guys. If you do, speak now or forever hold whatever you're holding. <laughs> That's <laughs> a like... loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> I can't claim credit for that one. Someone on the radio that I used to listen to used to say that. Uh, it looks like someone might be typing in our chat window. So I'll ask you the question. And if these are questions from them, we'll, we'll do those and then call it. Um, but I'm kind of curious as far as, because a lot of people I think who don't work for the railroad, but like trains, think they want to work for a railroad because they, there's this there's this perception of some kind of glory there. I just want to know what you guys think of of that idea that, like, is would would somebody somebody like that be in for a rude awakening, or is it just the most wonderful, amazing job that you've ever had? What, what do you think about that? Me or Kevin? It depends how you look at it. Yeah, um, we'll go Kevin first. I mean, I know for me, uh, for the, about the first three years, there was a time when I didn't even want to see a train after I left work, and I didn't love trains my entire life. So it's um, you know, if it's something that you really enjoy as a hobby, I would, you know, if, if it's something you really want to do, you know, then go for it. But if you really enjoy it as a hobby, I would be cautious. You know, it might ruin your hobby for you, um, at least for a period of time. And I know in this day and age, I think Dave will agree, if you're going to go to work for a railroad, find a short line. And find a short line that pays into railroad retirement. That's very important. Yeah, I, I agree with that completely. Um, it's kind of like buying a hobby shop. A lot of guys, oh, I want to run a, run my own hobby shop, and da 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 da. And then the ones that do always end up getting out of the hobby. <laughs> they burn yeah. out. Um, for me, I always wanted to be a railroader, uh, uh, and I, let, let's say it was on, on my list of things that I wanted, and. And starting on a short line was a real test for me because I was working with old guys. Most of them were all real G'd off of the Santa Fe or the SP. And they were nice guys. But these guys, all they knew were long days. They were 16-hour day guys, you know, that, that had no home life. So when I started, it was it was already a 12-hour day. And but we were out there 12 hours every day, you know, and I was 20 years old and I wanted to get my work done and go home and party. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that part of it was like, Ugh. but once you're on the train and you're and I always love switching, I always yeah. enjoyed switching cars, which is why I do a lot of that on my on my layout. Uh, but once you're there, it's different. Now, I, I have friends that uh, tried railroading that that were model railroaders or rail fans and. They washed out. They just didn't, you know, it wasn't what they thought it was going to be. But like you said, Kevin, I, I think that uh, uh, for anybody that's looking at starting on the railroad now, I don't think you have much choice other than to go to a short line because you know, the big railroads are laying people off. And uh, if you get on a, on a short line that's doing well, like Central Cal Traction, Modesto and Empire Traction, and hopefully your railroad will will grow and you guys will pick up more business that you know will be around long enough that you can make a career there and then i think it's a good way to go uh, but it's a real dicey field it really is i transportation right now with with this covid19 running around i mean the whole thing is the economy is unfortunately not doing good and and uh who's to say what's going to happen next yeah and you know, like with the with the class ones, you know, if you nowadays, if you are lucky enough to get on a class one, you're not going to have a social life for the first 10 years. So, yeah, kiss that goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> Your social life is at the hotel at the other end of the line. Yeah. OK, well, we've been going for a little over an hour and I didn't get a lot more any more questions here in the chat window. So I think we should wrap this up. Uh, anybody who's still on, feel free to hang around after I end the recording here, which I'm going to do now. But I want to thank you guys for taking the time for being here. And everybody who joined, I hope 
enjoyed that as as a perk for being on the train crew. And my thanks to you guys for for let, making this happen and being great guests and sharing your your information and your stories because you know a lot. I think that a lot of times stories like that disappear over time, and we have a chance to memorialize it here because I hope to if. if if I watch this again and think it was interesting enough, I may post this as a video to the channel so that people can see some of the things that we do as train crew people. So thank you very much. And maybe we can do this again sometime and have different questions because there's still a lot of stuff I'm thinking of that would be interesting to ask you guys, but I don't want to impose too much on your time. So thank you. Thank, thank you, John. Thank, thank you, you all for tuning in. Thank you.